Good morning. It is September 27th, and uh, I think most of the lawn care landscape industry are probably doing a little dance this morning. We finally started to see some rainfall with some more predicted for the next uh, period of time, and I'm sure the rush is on to try and catch back up. Online today, we've got Dr. David Gardner, Dr. Dave Shetler, and the inimitable Pamela Schratt for the OSU Turf Team Times. Uh, we would expect with the cooling temperatures and the return to somewhat more normal weather conditions, this might be the last of our weekly uh, events. We might go to bi-weekly uh, going forward, but um, we'll have to watch the weather, of course, and, and see where we are. Dr. Garner, uh, sorry, yes, Pamela Shrad, do you want to take it away, please? I will. Thank you very much, Dr. Nangle. So, um all right, so I just wanted to just give a brief history of what we've experienced this summer, what we can hope to experience in the next week, and then talk a little bit, tiny bit about renovation, which I'm sure we'll probably talk about more next week. Um, so this was the picture that we were, we've we all been uh, looking at for the last few weeks, um, up until Wednesday, I think, was this Tuesday or Wednesday was this snapshot of the drought in Ohio. If you look at the National Weather Service site, they actually said that the, the sort of center of drought for this year across the entire country was the Ohio River Basin. So we've had a considerable drought, um, 150 days without rain in some parts of Ohio, particularly the southeast. Um, from a deficit standpoint, um, these are the, some of the numbers that I got from Dr. Aaron Wilson, who we're very fortunate that he's he's the state climatologist for Ohio, but he's also in the in our college, in the College of Food, Ag and Environmental Sciences. And so we, we have that expertise in our college. I was talking to him at Farm Science Review last week and uh, we had, you know, I was having lunch with some of the farmers and talking to some of the farmers about a terrible time. Um, so these are some. This is some of the math that we that I got from Aaron last week, uh, with potential evapotranspiration rates, with the low low humidity and the warm temperatures, those high ET rates. We've lost about eighteen to twenty two inches of moisture from the system. Um, in addition to that, we're about twelve inches deficit on rainfall for the summer. And if you add those two together, we're around 30 to 34 inches of water deficit in the soil system. And we normally are around 40 inches. So there is a there is a huge loss of moisture from the soils in Ohio. So I guess that's the bad news. Um, and what, what we've been experiencing and talking about, I can tell you from Farm Science Review, that's all everybody was talking about was the drought. But anyway, uh, this was the seven day forecast we've we've looked at. This ended this morning. It was gen sorry, it was generated this morning. Um, this is the observed precipitation for the state. Uh, observed meaning that this was measurable water that was uh, this was water that was measured in a specific low tech location at a specific time rather than forecasted precipitation so this is great news we've had about three quarters of an inch of, of rainfall so far this is the forecast until that takes us till next thursday we are benefiting from the effects of hurricane helene um not to minimize the terrible time that people have had in florida and georgia today um this system is going to work its way up and continue, we are going to continue to get precipitation from the system. And so we will get measurable rainfall. And the great thing about this rain is that it is, is, is consistent. And so again, great conversations with Dr. Wilson this week about, about the quality of rainfall. So we don't just need rainfall, you know, if we were to have got two inches of rain last Thursday, uh, most of it would have run off because the ground is so hard and so dry. Um, we would have ended up with a lot of runoff. So we need this consistent, slow um, rainfall to gradually wet the soil and gradually enter the soil. And the term he used, and I really like it, is effective precipitation. And uh, he said there's a, a whole arm of 
research looking at this now? Uh, what is effective precipitation and how can we best arm farmers and growers and turf managers to look at um, building resilient systems for the future so that if we have a summer like we had this summer, we can better deal with it. Um, and so, so anyway, so that's where we are. So hopefully we will have a pretty decent and effective precipitation for um, the next few days at least. The window for renovation in Ohio is still open. The, you know, the textbook is mid-August to mid-September. We can push that towards the end of September. Um, as long as we've got the grasses established and mowed two or three times before the you know winter period and, and the hard frosts come in, we should be okay. So the window is still open. Renovation, well, recovery is going to be first. Um, I've been, I don't know about you guys, pleasantly surprised how quickly things greened up and started growing. Uh, I mean, it was it was overnight. Everybody's lawns just looked better. So uh, we are seeing a lot of recovery already. So the recovery and the and the renovations are going to be coming in hard and fast now. I think to try and get some of those dead patches, whether it was drought, diseases, insect problems, traffic. A lot of community fields have been dealing with horrendous traffic on top of drought. Uh, and so there's going to be a lot of renovation going on in the next next couple of weeks. OK, thank, thank you, Pam. And again, to go back to some comments earlier in the uh, September that this is, like Pam said, the ideal time for this, because we should be having su supplemental rainfall, uh, less problems with our annual weeds. Uh, and also reduce temperatures that might favor disease development, which is why we don't recommend strongly that seeding in spring is a good idea. However, we may need to have a conversation about that, uh, potentially maybe in a couple of weeks, if people run into problems with establishment and we do start to see frost coming in quicker than what we would have liked. Uh, Dr. Gardner. All right. Good morning. So on areas that um, you've got decent turf health, you could consider um, applying herbicides to uh, start removing some of your weeds, but you should probably put more of your effort into targeting perennials, for example. So things like spurge, purslane, a couple of things. These um, were hardened off enough by the weather conditions that we've had recently that herbicides are not um, all that effective on these. And since they're annuals, um, it'll be probably three or four more weeks before uh, temperatures become cool enough that these start to go away on their own. Same with uh, things like crabgrass, goosegrass, foxtail. Um, you know, we're probably about four weeks out from them starting to look a little bit more like the purple patches that I have in this particular picture. And so, um, you know, I would say that for any of those annual weeds, control those only for aesthetic cons considerations. So if somebody's complaining about the appearance of the of, of the lawn, um, I would go ahead and make those applications. But uh, just be aware that you'll probably have a reasonably easy time controlling the grasses. You'll basically be exacerbating or accelerating their decline. The broadleaf, the annual broadleaf weeds, though, um, they, they can be um, pretty difficult to control after they've uh, hardened off due to drought conditions. I, I had a couple of uh, people call in this week that uh, had sprayed some of the better herbicides that are on the market and it looked like they had done nothing, which is similar to the results that I get when I do those tests out at the OTF center. So, you know, those those weeds are more effectively controlled um, early in their life cycles with post-emergence herbicides. Or what you should also consider doing is going out, figuring out where all of those areas are and plan to apply a pre-emergence herbicide next year in order to maybe prevent those from germinating and or you can go back and uh, put a post-emergence out uh, when they're um, much smaller. Uh, field pass palum might be an exception. So this is a tropical grass, but it can persist in mode environments as a perennial um, here in Ohio, which um, maybe makes it a little bit unique. So if it has seed heads that look like this, so you know, like the plump fat seed heads on a uh, flattened seed stalk, then it is field pass palum, and that's actually a perennial. And so if this is still green and actively growing and in a place where it's bothering you, Tepramazone is quite effective. Um, you might not have time to make two applications three weeks apart, like I usually recommend, but you could at least get one application out. And that will probably be pretty effective at um, getting rid of the top growth. 
The only thing about that is, is that since it's a perennial, um, it persists underground with, you know, rhizome stolons. And so sometimes the herbicide will not translocate all the way through those. And so go back to those areas, May, even the third week of April, and start checking. Um, unlike when crabgrass and goosegrass germinate and you have tiny little seedling leaves, you'll have big, fat, mature looking leaves start poking out of the ground. I get emails at that time of the year often now where um, people make reference to, you know, like these giant mecca crabgrass plants that are infesting their lawn. And it's the field past phalum that's trying to reemerge. So you can go back, look at those areas and consider making another application of a Tipramazone at that time. Um, if you have sedge issues, that's another plant that will start going away on its own, but you can accelerate that by using one of our many sedge products that are on the market. Um, so, you know, Dismiss or Sedge Hammer are the ones that uh, people tend to run to first. Um, however, uh, Solero, Archon, or Bass Grant are all, also options for you. And that's what I have for today. Thank you, Dr. Gardner. Short and sweet. Dr. Shatler, have we got fall armyworm damage or no? Uh, I think on the fall armyworm, it's, uh, I think we're going to miss it. Uh, the the ones that I've got in that I've been cultivating here in my basement uh, are now uh, fifth instars. Uh, there are six instars uh, for this one, and the, and they're in the fifth instar, uh, uh, what which would be what I call the big fat sassy lawn mowing stage. Uh, they're they're big enough to to be eating the turf and and eating it down, and and I'm not seeing uh, anything like that. I had a couple of people that actually. Uh, did some soap flushes uh, in some areas where they had seen a lot of egg masses and they said nothing came up. Uh, so we may have dodged that bullet. Uh, uh, what, what I find is interesting is that this hurricane, uh, Helene, is coming up right through uh, the area of Georgia and uh, uh, South Carolina and North Carolina where they have been complaining bitterly for the last month uh, that they've seen more army worms than they've ever seen before. So it could be that we're going to get a whole bunch of moths blown up here. Uh, but I think with the cool weather that we have in the evening and frost predicted probably within the next three weeks, uh, that's not going to be successful either. So I think we've kind of dodged a bullet on that one. The bullet I want to talk about are white grubs. Uh, we had very good conditions for egg lay and egg hatch back in June and July. And it's been my experience that when those white grubs uh, can hatch out and feed through the first instar, they could withstand the drought that we had. Uh, basically what they do is they dig down about an inch into the soil and just make a little cell uh, and just sit there and do nothing uh, until the moisture comes back. So we're going to have that kind of moisture, at least in the southern half of the state. Uh, kind of the, I find it interesting, if you remember the map that Pam showed you, the northern third of the state actually has had a fair amount of moisture and was not in that heavy uh, moisture debt that the rest of the state was. And it's got, I find it kind of interesting uh, when she showed that map uh, right in Sandusky, uh, there's a white patch there that means that it's normal soil. And that's where I've had two complaints about white grubs uh, causing damage to the turf uh, 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 over the last week. Well, uh, what I'm saying is that grubs may appear. Uh, the grubs may just be in the, the second instar. Uh, and, and we do know that white grubs can overwinter uh, as mature second instar white grubs. They don't have to be third instars, so they can overwinter. Uh, especially if we have a fairly mild winter or a winter with good snow cover uh, and do just fine. So uh, what we need to do is, is talk about rescue, what I call rescue grub treatments. Uh, these are the treatments that we have to make late in the season here in, in late September, early October, uh, when the, the skunks and the raccoons have discovered grub populations and are foraging around uh, in those areas uh, and the only two products that I can recommend, uh, obviously our old friend Dilox uh, is still available, still on the market. There's even a homeowner Dilox formulation and a granule. Uh, 
And what you need to be doing is, uh, if you're going to be using Dilox, remember Dilox is water soluble. So it moves with irrigation pretty rapidly. However, if you apply that Dilox, whether it's a granule or a liquid to dry turf, and what I mean is dry, dry turf, that thatch, the, the thatch layer itself is dry. So get out your old soil probes, pull up a, a plug or get your pocket knife out and, and inspect that thatch. If it's not moist, uh, you probably ought to do an irrigation the day before you make the application of the Dilox. Uh, then the next day, apply the Dilox and irrigate it and water it in. Now, the beauty of Dilox is Dilox has what we call contact toxicity. So if the just the grub body comes into contact with some moisture that contains that Dilox, it's going to kill them. My other recommendation, Dilox has gotten kind of expensive. I have a feeling uh, that, that the uh, companies making Dilox are, are afraid that EPA is going to cancel it. So they're making as much money as they can uh, here because it, I mean, Dilox is off patent. It, it shouldn't be all that expensive, but it is. So you might want to consider uh, clothianidin or arena uh, products. We, in our studies, we've had very good efficacy uh, with arena, but the problem is, is that arena is not, does not have good contact toxicity. Uh, the grubs have to ingest it. So if you're going to use the the uh, if you're going to use the arena or the clothianidin uh, products, uh, again, make sure the thatch is moist, water it in afterwards. But I've got a picture here that I'd like to to share with you. And before you make that application, what I want you to see is what does the grub look like. Does the grub look like a milky white or does it have this sort of a light buttery yellow color to it? If it has this light yellowy color to it, it has stopped feeding for the season. So it's not going to ingest your arena. You'll have to use Dilox with the contact toxicity. On the other hand, if you take a look at the grub and it has that milky white color to it and the sequel sac is almost a, a black color, that means it's actively feeding and the arena will be a, a good selection uh, at that time. Okay, that's all I've got. Uh, gloom and doom with the grubs. Um, and <laughs> those are the, the uh, sort of rescue treatments that, that we can consider here in the fall. I take it, Dave, that the return to moisture means that the potential for the problems are going with the grubs going to uh, return to being more normal in a sense like that the development was somewhat stunted with the dry weather. Is that? Uh, my, my feeling is you may not see them uh, because uh, since they are smaller, if you've got a good stand of turf, it can withstand second in star white grubs. Uh, it's, it's usually not until they get to the third in star that they really start mowing all of the, the roots off and the crowns and, and uh, you know, feed through that thatch layer so that you can just lift it up like a loose carpet. Okay. All right, a uh, couple of last minute things. So uh, the OTF conference planning is uh, in heavy, heavy finish mode. Um, workshops, big deal on the Thursday, new edition. We have banters on the Wednesday afternoon. There's also a tour on the Wednesday afternoon um, going around OSU Athletics. Um, a grinding event on the Tuesday. Uh, Mr. Bob Becker at Sayola Country Club being very helpful with us. And Bernhard are stepping in there as well. Um, further to that, the uh, ATI Scholarship Golf Outing is on Monday, October 7th at Westfield, uh, at Westfield Centre here. So if you get the opportunity, uh, look on our social media for uh, registration or opportunities to help out. Um, with that, we will say thank you. And obviously, we will be adjusting the schedule based on what we see with the next few days uh, regarding the weather. Finally, the brutality is over. We can now deep relief. Except, of course, everybody's running around with their hair on fire because they got to get the seed down, but fertilizer down in panic mode. So best of luck, folks. We know you're going to be at it for the next probably seven to ten days. Hell for letter.